So hello everybody, it's 11 o'clock so my session should start. Yesterday afternoon we had two different sessions on color management. And uh, as you know, color management is a uh, uh, workflow basically, which guarantees you to be able to maintain constant color throughout the workflow, or at least if this is impossible, because sometimes it is impossible, how much you are going to be wrong in that case. Today we attack a different uh, subject, which is possibly even more important. And I've called this session color correction, when and how. Because uh, uh, color correction is not color management, it has to deal with image preparation, which is a different subject, as we will discover. Let me tell you who I am. I come from Italy. My name is Marco Olivotto. Um, I'm a physicist, curiously, but I work in the field of image color correction. So this is my specialty field, actually. Uh, something that once was called pre-press. Now it's a bit more complex because uh, it's a complicated word. We still have traditional printing, and I mean offset and flexor and all that. But we also have digital publishing, we have the web, we have photographic printing. All different worlds with something in common but many differences as well. I am a student of Dan Margulis, who is this American guy who actually invented color correction. And I've been following his courses uh, um, since uh, in the last uh, six years, basically. And my main job is being a teacher, writer, consultant, and what's left of image production. Okay, so, as I was uh, explaining, we know what color management is. We discussed that yesterday. It is a, a scientific approach to color consistency. We want to have constant color throughout the workflow, which means I open an image, see it on my screen, go to print it somehow, and I expect the result to be, if not identical, compatible, you know? So uh, it is a series of techniques and rules that you have to apply, and if you don't, most of the time you are going to be in serious trouble because there will be no consistency and your customers will not be very satisfied. But this area of color, and I mean color management, has nothing to do at all with image quality, which is as well important. Very simple example, if you give me a picture, say a portrait with a green cast and print it through a color managed workflow, what you get is a green print. You know, it does nothing to make your color better. The strive is to make color consistent with the original. Now, let me tell you what color correction is. Color correction is, again, a series of techniques, but the purpose of these techniques is improving images. And if you don't think it is uh, essential to improve images today, I'll try to give you a few examples that prove the contrary. Because uh, um, we, as long as I say, which image is better for you? You know, taste comes into play, especially if we are talking about something that is also artistic. But in the field of commercial imaging, I think the best image can be defined as the one that which attracts more attention from the customers. Let me give you a very simple example. You know, I'm going to be very practical, very pragmatic about this. You take two postcards, hmm? identical postcards produced in different ways. Put them in a shop and say 100 people walk in and buy one of the postcards. If 95 people buy the postcard on the left and five buy the postcard on the right, we can clearly say that the postcard on the left is better because it is a, you know, uh, it is a free choice from people who are not uh, probably technical enough to understand the difference, but instinctively with a heart, they will decide that something is better. Let me give you two very simple examples about this in Photoshop, what I mean. Okay, this is a picture that comes from my region in northern Italy. We have lots of mountains, woods and so on. We have a very active tourist board promoting things, you know, our land and trying to attract tourists. How do you think pictures are made? Do you think they call professional photographers and say, can you take pictures of the 
lens so that I can promote myself. Sometimes it happens, but this picture in particular comes from a campaign that they invented. They simply asked a group of tourists calling themselves photographers, you know, go around, take as many pictures as you can, you give them to us and we pay for your stay. Of course, it was great, greatly successful. They stayed for 10 days in the mountains, had hikes and so on, and they produced a lot of pictures. Do you, know, do you want to know how many? 40,000. Now, there is a principle, you know, that if you take a monkey, you know, and give it a keyboard, if it hits the keys long enough, the Bible or the Divine Comedy will come out in the end. This is more or less the same. Some of these pictures are not bad, but they are not suitable for commercial use. Hmm? So, you have woods here. I'm quite sure that the tourist board would prefer to see this. Because there is more variation, because there is more color, because you can see now that there are different kinds of uh, uh, trees in the forest. You know, it was a lot flatter like this. So think of this as a postcard. Let's get back to the example. This is probably the postcard that most people would buy if they had to decide between the two and no alternatives. Let me give you another example. This is more like a professional photographer. She went on a safari, found a white lion under a tree, and produced this picture. Well, she didn't produce the picture. The camera did. There is a slight problem. The camera doesn't see anything like we do. Suppose that I need to use this picture to promote this safari park or whatever it is called. I think a reasonable alternative could be this. Now, I know, because I've tried this many times, that some of you had an instinctive reaction to this version, say, no, it's too aggressive, no problem. You can have a more conservative version. One of the tricks in image preparation, especially when you're dealing with a client, is exaggerate and then back down if needed. You know, because if you are too conservative and you push the color but not enough, the, your client could say, yeah, nice, but I would like to have more. And then you're in trouble because you have to start again or anyway work on the picture more. Get a bit over the top and then use this slider in Photoshop called opacity to reduce the effect. Oh, sorry, not this one. Okay, to reduce the effect if you need. So you have a lot of options that remain open. Okay, now let's go back. There is a basic rule that you have to remember. A perfect image doesn't exist, period. There is a well-optimized image for certain output conditions, which is a lot different. Let me give an example. If you take any image, in principle, at least in principle, it should be prepared differently for photographic printing, for offset printing, and if you're going out to the newspaper, it's still different. If you take a CMYK file that would produce a very good output for a table book and print that on a newspaper, what you get is mud. It's terribly out low contrast, dark, and not an appealing photograph. So, the idea is we have an original and we should produce different versions, either by hand or automatically. I'm not entering into that now. So that they actually match the output, condi the output conditions we have. What do I mean by output conditions? In the end, to me, it's gamut. And I would like to give you a very provocative example. This is the laser printer, black and white laser printer, 120 euros that I have on my desk, where I print letters and everything. It is a printer, right? Okay. Now, suppose that you come to me with a very colorful image, and you give me this printer, and you say, print the image. 
it's a problem. Because this device has the tiniest gamut, the tiniest color space you can imagine. It can only print black dots, nothing else. You have the white, and that's the white of the paper. You have the black, and that's the black of a toner. You don't have grays, it's just smaller dots. So it's one color. I realize it's an extreme case, but it's a good example. Because there are basically two scenarios. The first one, with this introduction, I sit on the floor, cry for the rest of my life because I can't print your colorful image on such a printer. All right? This is not very positive, so let's see if I can do anything better. I optimize the image you give me and try to get the best result possible in black and white. End of the story. I have no choice. Do you want color? All right, give me a different printer. But if that's all I have, it is a lot more positive, a lot more, more constructive to start from the image and try to make the image such an image that it will print properly on that device. So the question is obvious. Which scenario do you think is better? I think better in this case is the only possible scenario that produces a result. It's not going to be a colorful result, but it is a result. Now, why do I do this kind of comparison? Because, let's expand a bit. Do not think laser black and white printer. Think offset, traditional printing. You know, the gamut is not that big. We have problems with intense blues, with very vivid greens. We can't print them on paper in the traditional CMYK process. To me, this scenario is exactly like the black and white printer, only it has a few more colors. Get the point? If you optimize your files for your output conditions, then you can get the best results given those output conditions. If you try to force your output device where it can't go, you will lose time, money, patience, faith, whatever. So the best idea is let's try to force the image to print properly on that kind of uh, device. So enter soft proofing. I call this soft proofing for the masses because there is a, a lot being discussed about this. Do you know what a hard proof is? If you go back to the days, this is a typical example where of traditional offset printing. Hmm? Now it's not done anymore. People think that computers can do everything on their own, but hmm, a computer, somebody yesterday said, I, I really like that, a computer and a software are as smart as the people who use them. Huh? They are not more intelligent. They can be faster, but they are not intelligent. So you go to the printer, and you need to print a book, say a photographic book. Which kind of reference will you give? If you are trusting that the printer will have the same monitor with the same calibration parameters as you, I'll be honest, good luck. It's not going to happen. You should, in principle, give him a hard proof, which means a certified printed proof on paper on whatever substrate and you should say, Mr. Printer, can you match this? If the printer says yes, that's his problem from then on. It's called, in Italian, hmm, we call this prova di stampa, which means uh, printing proof. It's not a good name. The Anglo-Saxon name is contract proof. That piece of paper is actually a contract between you and the printer, and the printer accepts to match with relative tolerances, of course, what you give him, all right? So, now, hard proofing is unfashionable because it is costly. It takes some money to produce a good certified print. So, um, 
soft proofing came in. And soft proofing is basically the same thing like I can do that in Photoshop. I can try to simulate on screen what a certain printing process will produce in the end. All right? Um, unfortunately, this depends a lot on which screen you use, how it is calibrated, how good the profile is, and a lot of several variables. In my courses, I have to deal with a lot of photographers who do printing at several levels. Very few of them print at home on an inkjet printer. They go to the labs, they go to printers, and, and the question is, how many of you are really satisfied with their results? My statistics is one out of ten. So nine people are mildly dissatisfied or strongly dissatisfied. Of course, we have a problem there. There is a, I use a very uh, heavy word, misconception, that your final output should match your screen. This is one of the things that all the talk in the forums on the web started, but the truth is different. We hope it gets close enough to uh, satisfy our client, but it is a very ill-posed problem. The, the starting point is very wrong, and I'll try to explain why. Well, the first point is that, of course, when I look at this PDF on my screen, what happens is that there are millions of tiny little lights throwing lights through the screen, and the light reaches my eyes. So it's back illuminated uh, media. But if I print this on a piece of paper, on a piece of cloth or whatever, it's going to be different. I hold a piece of paper like this, we turn down the light, and what happens? The piece of paper disappears. You can't see it anymore because it reflects light. It's a completely different phenomenon. We have what we call additive. Um, um, sorry, the, the RGB monitor is an additive method, and this is subtractive instead, CMYK. So, this is the common model that people have in mind. This is a picture. Let's suppose this is the original file, all right? I open it on the monitor, and I say, OK, well, it's just fine for the color, but it, it is a bit too light. You no, know, it doesn't really match completely. This picture is lighter than this one. And then I go to the printer. I actually press print on my machine, and that comes out. And if you see, the luminosity is more or less compatible, but that is a redder picture. The color is not fine. So we look at the monitor, we look at the output print, and we say they don't match, which is true. But there is a big problem. Uh, I have a seven-year-old son, and I go to the cinema with him. And we went to see a very nice uh, animation movie called The Crudes. Have you seen it? It's about uh, prehistoric people. And in the very last scene, they take a picture of themselves. They have a big slab of stone connected to some kind of fling, say. At some point, they cut a rope, and the slab of stone goes like this on their faces. And that's a picture. This is more or less identical. People think that printing something on a monitor is more or less like this. Imagine a piece of paper here, and I go like, Phew. Can you tell me, please, which connection there is truly between the printer and the monitor? They are completely independent. So this model is wrong also because for the last three minutes, I've been fooling you. Does someone in the audience see the lie I've been telling from the beginning of this slide. Do you see that, that, that there's something illogical? Can, which, wh what's that? Yeah, all right. OK, there, there is an effect that I'm using this particular projector, but there is something that is even deeper, the original. We never see the original. 
This exists, but it's hidden. This is a list of RGB numbers in a file. We see this and call this the original. Not true. Because if, if you have, let's go back to the example. Imagine you have this picture and a black and white monitor. You could only see it in black and white, but the original would remain in color. So this is a representation of the picture, but not the picture, you know? And this is something that the digital age tends to blur in our minds, you know? With my students, this is an example I used yesterday. I always say, if you look at the map of Paris for two hours, you haven't been in Paris for two hours. There is a strong difference between reality and a representation of reality. And this is the problem. We never see the original. It remains dark for us. The correct model is like this. The original, which is what we have, is represented on a device and in a completely independent fashion is represented on another device. So, matching the monitor and the printer is useless in itself. What we need to do is to try and match the monitor to an original we don't see and the printer to an original we don't see. This is a much clearer philosophy and it opens a lot of uh, uh, understanding of the process. Okay, so if we go and see something about textile digital printing, which is the big buzz in the industry now, we have basically two different kinds of technology, broadly speaking. We can print with pigments, which means we have a smaller gamut, so less colors, basically, if you want, but an easier workflow, less preparation of the cloth and so on. Or we can print with dye-based inks, larger gamut, more complex workflow. You know, beauty comes at a price, of course. If we want to have more colorful output, we need to prepare things better. Whatever we choose to use, what happens when we print our job, which is usually coded in RGB, red, green, and blue values, will go through a so-called RIP, hmm? which is not rest in peace, hopefully, for our print. It is a raster image processor. And uh, it is basically a very powerful, complex driver for a printer. We will have color profiles describing how the printer works with a certain substrate that we want to use. And the color profiles can be canned, as we say, or custom. Canned is because we buy a printer and the producer says, OK, if you use this printer with these inks on this kind of substrate, you will get good results. Use this profile, which is basically a description of how the printer works in that case. Or custom, we can make our own. Get out your spectrophotometer, measure patches, and build your profile. Or even on very advanced machines, profiling is automatic. The machine, you start a profiling routine, the machine produces a series of patches, they are measured automatically, the profile is produced, and everything goes automatically. Either way, we will have color profiles which we should use for previewing the image as we work. And I want to show you an example now. Now, in the following, I will show you with some examples a general workflow for color correction, meaning how do I try to make my color better given that I am, have a certain kind of output in mind. Warning, it takes usually two or three days, full immersion course, to really grasp the basics of this because it is not difficult, but there are many complex pieces that need to go together and it is also a very deep workflow. But this means that some, some things that I will say can sound rather weird to you, but believe me, uh, they work. And what we are going to do, we need to evaluate the colors 
check them against uh, a soft proof of the output and try to correct things in, uh, in that fashion. Let me just, oops, I did it, sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I will start with an image like this. This image in particular is one of the nightmares in offset printing. I'm referring to offset printing because, uh, not because we really want to do that, but because it's a model. What I say can be applied to any kind of output. Uh, can you imagine where the problem lies here? What's the problem? The blue jacket, all right. Why? Let me show you what happens when you try to print this in CMYK. Um, this boy has an electric blue jacket. There is no printing condition in the whole solar system where you can try to get this in CMYK. You can if you use additional inks, but that's another story. Suppose that with your budget you are confined to play with a small gamut, and I do mean small. Okay, we accept already that this color can be reproduced. In other words, sad to say that we are going to lose some of the color. But see what happens. If uh, in Photoshop I go proof setup and use working CMYK and try to see a soft proof Okay, this is common Y on, so that I can show you what happens. When I go and simulate what happens in CMYK, I'm not making a conversion, I'm just having a soft proof to see what happens. Do you see what, what's the problem? Not only we lose color, but we lose a lot of contrast as well. If you look at areas here, I hope it's clear enough on the projector, but it's terrible on my monitor. What happens is that in the places where you have variation of luminosity, everything gets dull and sparsed. You know, like common Y, you see how it, it goes from being a jacket to a, a rag, basically, you know. So, what do you do? I'll show you the worst thing you can do because some people think, okay, I'm losing a huge lot of color, so the best thing I can do is push the color as much as possible, trying to keep everything I can. Sounds good in principle, but it is wrong. Let me do something like this. I use a hue set, uh, I'm not using this. I use a hue saturation layer, which has, a, you see this tiny eyedropper. We are, oh, sorry. Sorry, there's something, all right, fine. Okay. There is this tiny eyedropper here. We are very lucky here because the blue is very different from anything else in the picture. If I just click with the eyedropper and drag left, what I'm going to do is to reduce saturation selectively and you see that anything else in the picture is untouched, whereas the blue has gone. Which means that I've automatically set up things so that I can control the saturation of the blue, all right? Now, see what, happen what happens here. I'm going to use, uh, okay, this is the original. I'm going to concentrate on the jacket. Let me turn the proof colors on and we see the, the saturation. See what happens when I push the saturation of the blue 
up as much as possible in a desperate attempt to retain all that I have blue. Things go absolutely worse. It gets flatter and flatter and flatter. You see, if I look at this without soft proof, now it's a truly strong electric blue. But this version, more saturated, is worse than the version without saturation. So what seemed obvious is wrong. And you can really understand it. It's a problem of gamut. Huh? You have somebody who is very tall and you have a bed which is very short. If you try to put this guy inside the bed, probably the feet will come out on one side. So what do you do? You stretch him. <laughs> you can't make the bed wider. The only thing you can do is, please, can you try to stretch up a bit so that you can fit in the bed? We need to desaturate. And you say, how about desaturating the blue that we are losing already? No problem, we've lost it. Let's try to keep contrast, at least. See? If I desaturate, this is a serious one, minus 50, all right? In the original, if I remove the proof colors, you see that the saturation is massive. We are losing color. Never mind, we are losing color anyway. Turn proof contract on and see what happens. This is what would come out in printing without desaturation. Uh, sorry, with my desaturation. And this is what would happen, I think, yes, with, without the desaturation. So, which one would you prefer to have? If I can't get the color, at least I would like to retain the shape of the cloth. And I don't have any doubt. Neither of my clients never had any doubt. They may get a bit noisy about the fact that they would like to have more blue. But the only reply you can give in that respect is, if you can pay for a Pantone ink going on overprint, we can do that, but not in CMYK. And this is a typical example of uh, trying to adapt the image to the output conditions so that everything works better, all right? This is it. Let me, have you, let me show you another example, maybe. This is another, another nightmare for any printing environment. Um, we could discuss what this picture is. Because this picture can be two things, if you think. Is this a portrait of a model? Or is this an advertising for the coat? They are two completely different photographs, in my opinion. Because in the first case, if I'm the photographer and I'm post-producing this for the model, the whole focus is on the face. I don't care about the coat. It must be visible, but it's not critical. Now suppose this is a fashion shot for the coat. The model, I'm sorry for her, but she's irrelevant. She can become paler or bit. It's up to you, really. But if you lose the coat when you print this, then you're in trouble. Now, I will show you what we should do when we are facing the second problem. Uh, one of the things we have to remember is that when we need to reproduce detail in the shadows, even the best printing environment is in trouble. It's not a fault of the printer. The technology is different. In particular, what we call the dynamic range of the image is very different. I'll try to give you a figure so you have an idea. If you're looking at uh, uh, an image on a very expensive, high-quality, top model monitor today, you can easily reach a contrast, and I mean a luminance ratio between the lightest point and the darkest point, which is about 1,000 to 1. In the best fine art printing conditions, except for exceptional cases, what we reach is exactly 
like what Giotto had so many hundred years ago, which is about 500 to 1, but 250 to 1 is more typical, which means that your monitor will show you a luminance interval like this, and your print will be like this. What can you do? You try to squeeze everything into a, a, a smaller interval. This sounds like a horrible tragedy, but never mind, because our visual system is very good at balancing these differences. But we must be aware of them. If you try to print this as it is, uh, it's very, very unlikely that you will see any detail in the code. Even on the projector, you might think that there is no real detail and that the, clo and that the code is simply a b almost a black blob. I'll show you this is not true. If you go image adjustments, uh, where is it? Shadows highlights you can realize how much, yeah, how much there is hidden in the shadows, all right? I'm pushing it very far now because uh, otherwise you wouldn't see it on the projector. What you are doing here, like it or not, is what photographers call HDR. HDR. It's not proper HDR, but it's a pseudo HDR, like uh, try to take information from the shadows and the highlights if you need and put them back into the picture, all right? Now, which, uh, which kind of uh, result would we have with a picture like this? I have a very clear answer for once, just two words, everyone will understand it. It depends. It depends on the technology we use for printing. This is an extremely, and I do mean extremely difficult, image to print in CMYK old-fashioned. But if you go on paper with digital printing, this is a lot easier. Let me tell you a story. This is interesting. Um, how many of you are printers by, uh, by trade? OK. So you probably maybe have heard about this problem. Uh, about two months ago, I was called by a group of photographers. They were putting together a photo book, and they were playing. They were printing with a big company we have in Italy, and they print on demand. You, if you want to have an idea of what the result is, can send your files. They will produce for a fee, of course. One book, print digitally. They send it back to you, you evaluate the book, decide if you need to make changes, and then go for the final run. They did so, they were dissatisfied with the results, and they called me because they were not so acquainted with CMYK and said, what can we do? The pictures are too dark. And indeed, they were dark, also because it was black and white, and it was all pictures taken at night. So, imagine big, black areas, very dark. And I said, okay, these are special files. We need to make a certain kind of preparation. And I did it. They redid the proof, printed proof. They got the second copy. Fantastic. We like it. Go for the, go, go for the actual run. And they printed about a thousand of these books. Only the printer did the proof on a digital machine but the book was printed in offset when it came back. It was horribly dark. They got a bit angry with me and said, so, did you prepare the files badly? No. The problem is that the technology had changed. It was a bit darker than usual, but I thought it would be pr printed digitally. And I know that digital printing is a lot more stable and has less problems in the shadows than offset printing. Otherwise, I would have produced a lot lighter files, you know? In the end, it turned out it was a fault of the printer, and they accepted to redo the run. But just to give you an idea that even a printed proof is not enough if the technology changes in the middle, and you are not in control of this.
which is one of the big problems. When I post-produce an image, I have no idea who will print it, how, where, which technology will be used. So you come to a conclusion that the best file for printing is not the one, in general, of course, that prints best. It's the one that gives you less problems when it is printed in general. Then, of course, if you're working on a big campaign for a big company, you must be in control of the results. That's a typical, that's a typical case. But in general, believe me, especially in fashion, when you retouch the picture, you have no idea which magazine will use it, uh, printed how, on which paper. So it's really a Russian roulette, and you have to be very, very, very careful. To be honest now, the picture has disappeared, but if I, if I had to prepare this shot for, uh, for fashion printing, I wouldn't absolutely be afraid of using this version rather than the other one. Someone may argue, well, yes, but it's a bit too light. Never mind. The difference in printing is uh, too light and visible or a big black blob of ink with no detail. Please, give it lighter to me. <laughs> At least I see something. Of course, if I go completely all over the top like this, well, then probably it's not good. Hmm? But you have no idea how many cases like this one I've seen with uh, magazines going to print with files that have all the necessary details in the black clothes and then they come out completely closed in printing. You could go with a densitometer and find infinite ink on the paper. So it's very common. Okay. And uh, I would now like to finish with uh, an example, which is uh, my students find this one of the best examples because it's very instructive. This is a very simple pictures from vacations, you know. There is a saying, if you go through the history of art, from the first cave paintings, really, 30,000 whatever years ago, up to today, and you go through the Renaissance, and you go through even modern art, you realize that every generation of artists understood one thing. It's so obvious that we don't think about it. In any artwork, look at this, there must be a lighter point and a darker point. End of the story. If these points are not optimized for the full range of what is being printed, the image will not be so good. Imagine these graphics. I think the lighter point is uh, on the astronaut helmet. All right. Suppose that comes out gray. Everything is, has less contrast. And the actual result is that when people come here, this will not pop out to them. So it's one of the very basic principles. Someone who is uh, less diplomatic than I am said, yes, everybody understood this principle since the cave times except for one category, and that is photographers of the 21st century. Because uh, now, digital cameras tend to do their own thing. And the digital camera, in this particular case, did something very obvious. You've noticed there is a sun here. You can't get any lighter than that. And what the camera did was putting the white point in the middle of the sun the sensor, to be very easy, was red. Oh, there's a highlight there, nail it down. And this is what came out. This is a JPEG file produced from the camera, by the camera. There is a slight problem that the light point in a picture is not the lightest point at all. Look here. 
Look at this white band. This is absolutely not important in terms of detail. It is a white band. It has no texture. It has nothing. This point, I have to stretch here, is probably more important because if we burn the lights there, then we, won't, we, we, we would not be able to see anything on the astronaut. So, let me show you through threshold what happened. I'm simply isolating in white the areas that are lighter than a certain value. And we have the proof here that the sun is the lightest area. But see how little there is here until we get to a point where we discover that the most significant and light area is not in the sun, which has no texture at all, but in the postcard, or if you prefer, on the shoulder of the woman. I'll show you what's behind the picture. Let me just remove the opacity. The postcard is the lightest object. If the sun burns, I don't care at all. It has no texture, it is a hole. Anyway, leave it there. It's burned already, it can't be reproduced in a picture. Okay, so this is something that we humans can make, but it is also something that a computer has a lot of serious difficulties to make. You know? At the same time, I could go for the... Okay. I could go for the darkest point in an image and discover that the most significant extended area in the darkness is in the woman's hair. What I did was throwing a couple of color samples in the picture and they have values that can be read here. All right? Now, if you had to bet, more or less, what kind of color do you think the postcard should be, more or less? Could it be pink or green or blue? I think it should be white or slightly yellow because, well, you know, I've seen about one million postcards in my life and I've never seen, honest, a brightly blue postcard. But look at the numbers here. In RGB, the three components, the red, the green, and the blue, should be identical in a neutral point. And this point, number one, is the one we put here on the postcard. The maximum is 255 in each channel, that's the correct name. And I have 195 in the red, 214 in the green, and 241 in the blue. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that we have a green-blue cast in the image. Now, let me show you what happens when I simply go and balance these numbers. And to make the whole thing more interesting, I'll make the image <laughs> disappear. I'm not looking at the image at all. I'm just looking at the numbers and using a curves adjustment layer to push 195 close to the edge, but not quite right to the edge. Green goes like this, give it the same number, and with blue, we are more or less already there. How about the hair? Well, the hair could be brown. She's definitely not a blonde. It could be black. But in principle, our eye is not sensitive to color in the shadows. And by shadows, I mean the dark parts of the picture. So I could safely say that I want to represent the hair as black in that area. Black would be zero, zero, zero in the three channels. But I'm not going to kill the shadows completely. And what I'm going to do starting for the blue is reach about 10. You see, it's this number here. And I'm just moving the bottom of the curve so that I reach the number I want. And sorry, and here's the red. All right. Now, final result, we have very, very similar number. If you're out by one unit, it's not really important, both for the highlight and the shadow.
Now, let me turn this curve off, make it invisible. I will show you again the original and then turn on the curve. Which one is better? Also because you should consider that this image was not obviously shot at Christmas time on the top of a mountain. It's summer. She's writing postcards. She is obviously starting to tan. We think the original atmosphere was a warm tone, not a cold tone. I don't have time to show you, or maybe I'll show you without explaining. If I revert to the original picture, we have fashions in Photoshop where we can simply go and explore. You see where I am with the eyedropper, the woods. And if we forget for a second about RGB numbers and read LAB numbers, these two negative values show you that the wood is blue. Have you ever seen blue wood of this kind unless it is painted? This is obviously raw wood, but well, it could be for once, you know? Like, let's have a look at the stone here. Minus three tells me it's towards green. Minus six, it tells me it's towards blue. So we have a potentially whitish rock that looks blue. I'm starting to have a problem here. Look at the sand. The sand is uh, green and slightly blue. I haven't seen green sand. Maybe in canyons, but this is not a canyon. So I have four different areas. The sheet of paper, the postcard, which was green-blue. The wood was blue. The rock was blue. The sand is green. There is a greenish-blue cast. There is no doubt. Let me correct the image with just one curve and see again which numbers we have. This is a very desaturated red. We call it brown, usually. It's brownish, fantastic. See, this was before, this is now. Let's see the rock. Positive numbers is a warm color. This is slightly, very light and slightly orange. This is it. This is a magenta component. This is a yellow component and together. They make, they would make red, but yellow wings, so it's orange, basically. And let's see now, how about the sand? The sand is, again, slightly orange. It's more, ye it's yellowish with a tiny bit of red. So, these colors are better. The funny thing is, it's like yoga meditation. If you stare at this image, unless it has a ridiculously strong cast, for long enough, your visual system will see it correct. You need the numbers to know what you're really looking at. The problem is, print this out with a white border, and the white border will become the reference, and the picture will be horribly blue. I've shown you that it was negative in LAB, in the B channel. Now look here. In the postcard, we were off by minus 17 points. This is seriously blue, believe me. So the idea is evaluate colors, find a proper highlight and a shadow, change the numbers so that they fit reevaluate colors and when you reach a result like this then you're finished you're in good business and you have a better image that can be printed hmm? we could discuss if the artistic interpretation of the photographer would like to give a colder cast to this kind of image but to me it's not appropriate one of the examples and i'll finish with this is uh, 
I think I'm missing the English word. It's the powder, powder probably, you use in washing machines, you know? Think of a commercial shot to advertise the washing powder. Usually, you have big white blankets. Take a picture, that should go on a magazine. As a post-producer, I am asked to make them neutral, but I know that if the yellow ink says, hello, I'm going out to see how the world is today, and the whole picture comes out yellow on 50,000 copies in the magazine, yellow blankets are not a good idea to advertise the powder. I'll make them blue, believe me. Cold in our imagination is clean in this case. But then, if you are dealing with a catalog of wedding gowns, the white is better towards the yellow. It's warmer. It's not dirty. It's more romantic. So you see how the interpretation of color varies according to the final use we are going to make of the picture. This is it. I hope I've convinced you that pictures should even stock photographs, believe me, should be tweaked before going to print. And this is a very exciting and funny thing to do most of the time. <laughs> and the final remark is that there are no bad originals. There are only bad Photoshop operators, they say. So you can do this and a lot more.